Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Security State of the Union. I'm Steve Schmidt. I'm Vice President of Security Engineering and Chief Information Security Officer for Amazon Web Services. Uh, many of you I've seen before in the audience, which is kind of fun, and uh, hopefully some of you got a chance to see Tuesday Night Live last night where we made some announcements about how we do things which are kind of in the, the realm of entertaining statistics and fun differences from the normal way of business. And a lot of the difference in the organization is driven by scale. Uh, when you look at AWS, uh, it's kind of amazing. We've been continually expanding our services around the world to support virtually any cloud workload, more than 100 services right now. Uh, and we've launched over 1,000 features. I think the number is 1,042, uh, either features or services this year. And that's kind of amazing when you think about the 3,900 features that have been in, launched at AWS across the, the life of the, the platform. Every one of those features or services had to go through an application security review, which when you think about the velocity that's required there and the staff that's required to do it is kind of an amazing feat. Uh, by the way, 467 of the features or services that were launched this year were focused on security. So almost half. And that shows you the kinds of investments that we're making into ensuring you can use our systems, our services with confidence that your data is protected the way you expect. Now this is security operations at a massive scale, and the massive scale is global. And it's global for a really good reason. It's because you need to have data locality. You need to have data locality for performance. You need to have data locality for governance purposes. One of the things that we're very clear about in this process is that when you place your data in an AWS region, and a region, of course, is a geographic area where we have multiple availability zones, your data stays there. We don't move it around. We don't change where it's located without your instruction to do so. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't create a backup and recovery or high availability regime that's appropriate for your particular business, but you're the one who gets to make that decision and whether the data is moved from one region to another. 44 availability zones. An availability zone, by the way, is the customer-facing equivalent of a data center. Why is it a customer-facing equivalent of? Because some of our availability zones are very large. There are many physical buildings. So it's not just one physical data center that makes up an AZ, but many. Across 16 regions, uh, we announced recently 17 more AZs in six more regions in Bahrain, China, France, Hong Kong, Sweden, and a second uh, GovCloud region in the United States. The point of that is it will give you even more control over where your data is located, the ability to put it in one particular part of the world to meet particular requirements. Now, data is something that is necessarily virtual, but the transport of data can sometimes be physical. Uh, if you've used our data ingest or export system called Snowball, uh, you've experienced what it's like to use the bandwidth of a FedEx truck, uh, which is often much more than fiber can provide. Uh, Snowball has moved an incredible number of objects, almost five billion, actually over five billion at this point. Um, and the, the worldwide scope of this is such that we have these devices in shipment everywhere all the time. Now, shipping your data via one of these devices, of course, means that you're entrusting it to a physical carrier. You're moving it from one point to the other. And if you look carefully at the way the Snowball system is constructed, the only data that ever resides on the Snowball itself is encrypted. And that encryption process happens at your systems, not within the confines of the Snowball itself. Thus, even if the, the disks within the Snowball were compromised, you're the one who holds the crypto key. You pass that crypto key to us through another path, not the Snowball device itself. Another scale statistic, which is kind of interesting here, DynamoDB, a trillion requests a day. Uh, additionally, on average, AWS customers are using more compute capacity on EC2 spot instances today than customers did in 2012 running across the entirety of the EC2 fleet. And Spot, of course, is our set of uh, EC2 services that are available for bid for very low price, uh, sort of a, a market in availability. S3 holds trillions of objects and peaks at millions of operations per second. What does that mean from a security perspective? How often are you manually logging in to systems? What causes the largest number of problems in systems? Is it zero-day vulnerabilities or some magical APT that a unicorn brought? No, it's human beings. It's people who make mistakes. It's people who have good intentions but get fished. 
It's people who use the same credentials in multiple locations and don't use a hardware token for multi-factor authentication. So we believe really strongly that we have to keep a very careful set of constraints around our staff on how they access information, how they use our services, and most importantly, we need to watch. We need to carefully understand what they do every day, and is that consistent with our expectations for their use of our services? This results in a lot of trust. When you think about us as a business, we are really a trust-based business. We don't have those wonderful smiley boxes that you get in uh, the mail or from UPS uh, from our, our cousins in the retail organization. It's all about the data that you hand us and you want it back when you ask for it. And as a result of the, the, the systems that we've built over time, the assurances that we've been able to provide, the audits that we've gone through, customers across a lot of different industries have demonstrated that trust in us, uh, including the top uh, 50 innovative tech startups are all operating on AWS in the fintech space. Genomic sequencing, which of course deals with that most intimate of things, our genes, also runs on AWS. Why? Because Organizations like Cal Berkeley have found that they can design systems which protect the anonymity of the individuals who are contributors to those studies in ways that they couldn't otherwise, using the tools like our key management platform. Now, I talked last night a little bit at Tuesday Night Live, and one of the things I focused on quite a bit is mechanisms. Amazon loves mechanisms. Mechanisms drive repeatable, correct behavior. Remember what I said about human beings? They're the ones who make the mistakes earlier. Mechanisms help enforce good behavior across organizations when humans must be involved, when you can't do the job with tooling alone. The kinds of mechanisms that we use, for example, include things like our CEO, Andy Jassy, meeting with the senior vice presidents in the company for an hour every single week, focused just on security because that sets the right tone across the organization. And he says this very publicly in his keynote addresses, that security and operational performance are our top priorities. So he sets that tone across the organization, and that flows down then through the rest of the service teams who build and operate the things that we have. I have mechanisms on my team. For example, I have a weekly review with our application security team that we call our weekly business review. It focuses on what application security reviews are in progress, what the launch dates are for those particular features or services, how they're progressing towards that. Are they at risk of not being able to launch? One of the things that I believe very strongly in is setting the right culture within security organizations. Many security organizations start with a culture of, no, you can't do that. Stop. That doesn't work. It doesn't. Businesses will find ways around you, if that's your way of thinking. The velocity of change in our world is too high to have this, oh, I'm going to stop all the things kind of attitude. Instead, we got to focus on how do we accomplish things? How do we make things successful? How do we prevent the salesperson who wants to take home all the customer data on his laptop and leave it on the train? from becoming a problem for our organization. The traditional way, no, don't do that. Well, you're right, you really shouldn't. But let's find a way to solve this problem instead. Let's find a way to get done the analytics that he needs. Getting back to application security reviews, I focus on our AppSec team with how are we going to get to launch successfully with every one of those services. By the way, 1,892 application security reviews in the last 12 months. 1,892. And an AppSec review is not some rubber stamp paper thing. It's everything from developing the threat model to penetration testing of our services. We believe in 100% penetration testing. And penetration testing is not a point in time. It's something that we do constantly across our organization. And that's intentional. It's about making sure that we are keeping up with the changes in the, the landscape. However, the single biggest needle mover we have as a company in the security space is a project we have called Security Expectations. 
The things that are listed on the screen here are some of the many security expectations that we set. How does this work? Uh, if you've ever read anything about uh, the way Amazon does organizational planning, for example, we have a, a periodic planning cycle. Many companies have a five-year plan or a three-year plan. We have a one-year plan, and we're pretty confident that the day that we issue the one-year plan plus one month, uh, we're going to be wrong, and it's going to be outdated. But we have a one-year plan anyway. Now, the point there is that in that one-year plan, my team sets a series of expectations and their associated measurable goals for every service team in the company. Things like radically restrict and monitor human access to data. Why? Back to that piece in the beginning, humans make mistakes. So get the humans away from the data. Well, how do you do that? The naive way to do that is to say, okay, this year uh, you have to cut 10% of your team's access to, to data. In which case, you look at your team and you say, okay, who doesn't have to do that work anymore? And you say, I'm at the goal. That doesn't really change behavior. It narrows the scope of problems slightly. It doesn't really change behavior. So when service teams came up to us and said, what, what does radically restrict mean? 80, 80% reduction in human access to data. Whoa, why the heck did you choose that number? Because it's impossible to achieve without tooling, without automation. It's to drive people to use tools for things that they would otherwise do by hand. Source code security. Who in the company really needs access to your source? Do you check to see who is accessing your source? Do you check to see what they've changed? Where it's been moved to? We have programs internally where we watch our own software development engineers access to source code. Source code they're authorized to have access to, but are they using it in ways that are consistent with our business expectations for them? It is normal for software development engineers at different levels to check in different numbers of lines of code in a day. If all of a sudden they deviate from that norm, something's going on. It may be completely benign, it may be completely normal, they may have had a wonderfully productive day, but something's different. So we alert their managers that something is different than the norm. There are certain things that are red flags. So for example, if you are a software development engineer and all of a sudden I see you download all of the source to particularly interesting things, we're going to go have a conversation with you. Uh, because that's something you really don't need to do your job. And it may be indicative that you're planning on leaving the company with something on your hand. Patching. Oh my goodness, security vegetables. Nobody loves this one. Nobody. But it's something we have to do. We subscribe to the FedRAMP standards amongst every other freaking thing on the planet. And the FedRAMP standards for patching are the ones that are sort of the most universally applicable. And it's the ones that we enforce across our infrastructure. But that means that our service teams have to make sure that they have patches applied to all of the stuff that they're running. Now, as you all know, patching is a gloriously precise operation that succeeds every single time when you do it. So what's the best way to deal with patching? Don't. Wait, you just told me I have to patch. Blue-green deployments, folks. Shoot the old version in the head when you've got the new version running. Don't try and patch in place unless there's no way you can get around it. And if you do plan on patching in place, you better be validating the patching process works successfully. One of the very important reasons that we implemented Amazon Inspector, it had a requirement for every service team to be running an EC2, was I can validate that they've got their patching right with it. And it operates at scale. Log retention duration. How many security operations staff we have in the audience who have been asked to retrieve logs because an incident occurred, and they said, ooh, they've gone to dev null. <laughs> yeah, nobody likes to be that person who has to come and say, we used to know what happened. Log retention's cheap, people, please. Think about it that way. I mean, good grief. Amazon Glacier is so inexpensive, you can keep enormous piles of logs. One, one of our services generates 27 petabytes of logs a day. One. And we retain those for years and years and years. Because once they're gone, you can never get them back. And we're always getting better at analytics. Apparently, we're gonna have a little music fest here. Credential blast radius reduction. 
Uh, when you have an AWS account, you get a set of credentials with it. Number one, you shouldn't be using the root credentials. Please don't use the root credentials. Use IAM users that are minimally scoped to the, the work that you have to do. And more importantly, when you get access keys, rotate them regularly. I guarantee you, you'll go through exactly the same process our service teams did. You want me to rotate those? Oh, wow, I don't know where they are. Well, we had to fix that internally. And customers can fix that through a lot of different ways, including things like EC2 roles, where we do the rotation for you behind the scenes. Uh, makes your life a lot easier. I hate old, crusty, moldy credentials lurking around in places because guaranteed the good guys will not know where they are, the bad guys will inevitably find them, and then you will be sad. So let's not go there. Uh, credential lifespan reduction. Credentials should not be long-term secrets. They're not things that you should depend on to operate your business over a very long period of time. They're things that you should say are disposable objects. When we set credential rotation intervals or credential lifespan goals within the organization, we measure those credentials lifespans in hours. It makes it really hard for an adversary to pivot because what's a phenomenally useful alarm? An expired credential being used. I may not know how you got in the front door, but I know you're trying to knock. TLS implementation. Uh, many of you know that we built our own TLS library. It's called S2N. Why did we do that? Well, OpenSSL is a phenomenal product, but it also does everything plus cat. So it is huge, 450,000, 460,000 lines of code. And of course, with every single line of code, there is an opportunity for a bug. As we all know, SSL and TLS in general have been a target of a lot of uh, examination by researchers over time. So we did what we typically do in these circumstances. We do it with hardware. We don't need all these functions. Get rid of them. So we built S2N, about 5,000 lines of code, a little bit smaller. Happens to be quicker, too, which is nice. Um, all of S3 has been running S2N as the TLS code for uh, a year and change at this point, I believe. AWS encryption everywhere. We require our service teams to ensure the data is encrypted at rest and in flight. Why did I say AWS encryption everywhere? We don't restrict service teams on how they can encrypt data. We just say that they have to and meet certain expectations in that process. But it's a heck of a lot easier for them to do it and do it properly when they're using our tool sets. It's also a lot quicker for them to do that because that part of the application security review is a tick box. You're using something that's current, good. Canaries and invariants. If there's one thing that's on here that everybody should think about, it's canaries and invariants. When you're designing services, does part of the initial design of your service include both positive and negative canaries? Is the functionality doing what I think? It should. And does it not do something that it should not? And are you testing for that? Far, far too often, people make the error of thinking, well, I'm going to test to make sure that this particular credential gets passed and is used successfully. Well, what about the one that should be blocked? Well, I mean, come on, folks. Software always does exactly what happened. you expect it to do. Before we built our own networking equipment, we used gear that we bought from other people. One of the things that we found early on was that when you set a configuration on a router, the router would tell you, I am using this configuration. Unfortunately, sometimes when it's, I'm applying this particular set of ACLs, it does not. We found that out the hard way. So now we use canaries to watch everything like that, to ensure that the device is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. This one, keep the people away from the data. Well, wait a minute, we're, we're all in here talking about data, and last time I checked, we're human. Uh, but no, there is, a, there is a meta point here that's really, really serious, and that is we often give people excessive access to data, data access they don't need to do their job. We typically do it because it's convenient, it's easy, it's the simplest thing to do. I'm just testing and I'm just testing never gets turned off, or I'm just testing on live data, mm -hmm. that's a little scary. But the important thing here is that you should make a very particularly draconian, frankly, effort to restrict the access of human beings to data that they don't need to do their job. 
It is convenient and easy to give people everything, but it is unfortunate when that person has a bad day because they clicked on the wrong link and that they shouldn't have opened in the first place. So what was our big announcement from last night? Amazon Guard Duty. For those of you who haven't heard of Amazon Guard Duty before, uh, it is a continuous security monitoring service that identifies threats to your AWS resources and accounts using a combination of means, including some really interesting machine learning. Now, yes, machine learning is sort of the unicorn buzzword of the day. Uh, but this is serious business about doing something that's critically important to all of you. Your single most valuable asset in your organization is a good security engineer. They are the only person object thing program who can make a reasoned judgment about the gray area that exists in security. So we need to focus their attention on that which really matters. So one of the, the fun things that we talk about a lot is how do you reduce the noise in the process of security and how do you increase the signal validity? Guard Duty focuses a lot on that. Uh, for example, when we look at things like CloudTrail streams or VPC flow logs or DNS queries that are made coming out of people's infrastructure, it's an enormous amount of information which can give you a lot of clues on what's going on in your infrastructure. But properly examined, you can understand exactly what's going on that you like and what you don't like. So we aggregate information from our own team's threat intelligence work. We go out there and keep an eye on bad guys to understand what they're doing. And we integrated two partners as well, CrowdStrike and Proofpoint. They're in um, feeds into GuardDuty. Now, the cool thing about GuardDuty is it gives you that intelligence-driven uh, threat identification without installing an agent on your box. There's no sensor that you have to deploy, no network appliances. There's no footprint in your AWS account. Uh, we are particularly proud of the difficulty of enablement. If you have not yet tried it in the AWS console, you really should. It's very difficult to tick that one box and hit OK. But that's literally the level of effort that's required uh, to enable this. Uh, we cover your EC2 instances, your AWS services that you use, and your accounts in AWS. It does a bunch of anomaly detection and uses machine learning to help winnow down all of that data to understand the behavior that's normal for your resources in AWS. Some fun facts. Guard Duty currently processes about 165 million flow log events and 68 million IP reputation lookups per second. And it's just launched. So as it gets bigger, obviously that number goes up. The wonderful thing about data like that is it's incredibly rich and we learn a lot more about what's good and what's not by looking at that information. That's one region, by the way. So this is an example of the kinds of things that Guard Duty detects. Uh, the idea here is to detect activity that may be from a, an IP that you really don't want your infrastructure talking to. Things like a, a botnet command and control server, or maybe one of your EC2 instances is observed to be Bitcoin mining. You know, that may be something you want to do. Uh, Bitcoin obviously would just cross 10,000 at the moment. Um, but realistically speaking, most people don't intend their production exchange server to be Bitcoin mining on the side. It also detects things like activity from an anonymizing proxy. Uh, one of the things that we look for internally, for example, is any AWS credential that belongs to an AWS employee being used from a Tor node. There may be a valid reason for that, but we want to talk to the people who own the creds to make sure that's copacetic. It detects things like people trying to break into your EC2 instance by SSH brute forcing. Uh, or maybe you've used a, a key pair, a user ID, password, et cetera, that had been compromised somewhere else. Customers and partners have been really important contributors to Guard Duty. The customers on the left uh, have been with us since the beginning uh, during the process of building Guard Duty. They've helped shape it. They've told us what's most important to them. And the thing that's interesting about that is we have everything from the, the big uh, traditional business all the way down to the, the sort of little startups, financial services in between. And all the partners on the right have integrated their existing services or software with GuardDuty. So if you're already using, for example, Splunk, 
for security analytics. They integrate with GuardDuty today. Uh, all of the partners, by the way, who are on the right side there have booths, and you can go see their integrations with GuardDuty at the expo, and I encourage you to take a look. So Twilio is a great example of, of how a customer has chosen to use GuardDuty. The important thing there is they were looking for a way that they could focus on the pieces that were critically important to do something about right now as opposed to trolling through data to go figure out what happened six, eight months ago. And the timeliness of the alerts, the fact that you can get an alert at the most in about 15 minutes on average in about five, and by the way, that limitation is based on the log delivery delay that you see to the front end of the system. The rest is approximately real time. So now I'd like to welcome to the stage one of our beta customers for Amazon Guard Duty, Varam Sukyas, who is Vice President of Application Infrastructure and Operations with Warner Brothers Technology. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Varam Sukyas, and I'm with Warner Brothers Technology. I'm excited to share how we've used various AWS security services, such as Inspector and Guard Duty, amongst others, to help us integrate security into our DevOps culture. Our usage of these services provide us with the security guardrails that we require while providing the flexibility and independence that our application support teams crave. But first, let me tell you all a little bit more about Warner Brothers. We are the global leader in the creation, production, distribution, licensing, and marketing of all forms of entertainment. If you saw Wonder Woman in a movie theater or at home, if you watch The Big Bang Theory or Young Sheldon on TV, if you play video games like Batman Arkham VR, or if you ever bought anything from the DC Universe for your kid or for yourself, you are one of our customers. We've been around for more than 90 years, and today we're at the forefront of every aspect of the entertainment industry. To give you a sense of the scale of our organization, we have tens of thousands of titles in our digital archive. We are number one at the domestic box office for 2017. We currently have more than 85 series on TV, ranging from broadcast networks, cable, SVOD, and first run syndication and animation. We're a leader in video games with huge hits like Injustice 2. We're a powerhouse in consumer products with a 47% increase year over year in profits from 2015 to 2016. And we're expanding our digital networks with brands like Drama Fever, Machinima, Ellen Digital Ventures, and more. Now, many of these businesses that I just mentioned are already using AWS to succeed. That being said, our journey to AWS isn't complete yet. We still have many workloads that we're moving over. To help set some context, though, around our strategy, there's a few important elements that I should call out. We've embraced a multi-account strategy, and this is very much done on purpose. To give you an idea of the scale of this strategy, we currently have over 225 accounts up and running ranging from production workloads, dev tests, et cetera, from a wide range of applications. Now, we believe that there is an inherent security win by doing it this way. By isolating your applications, or a set of common applications, into a given account, you limit the blast radius of something that could go wrong. So much like I wouldn't expect a breach within one of your accounts to impact Warner Brothers, we wouldn't expect an issue within one of our 225 plus accounts to impact one of its neighbors. The next big win that we believe you get with this strategy is better agility. Now, we're a big place, lots of people working on lots of projects. It's hard to make that coexist in a handful of accounts or one account. By separating these out into little buckets of application or applications, we allow these disparate support teams to iterate as quickly as they can. Finally, there is a certain amount of billing clarity that you get that's optimal by doing it this way. So while you should have tagging policies and that's all important, by putting an application into its own account, it becomes very easy to understand what the TCO is of that application. Now that being said, we leverage many AWS security services to help us sleep at night while we maintain our agility. 
Some of you might be thinking that the management, just from a security perspective, across 225 accounts is something that's hard. And you're right, it is hard. You must think about the problem very carefully and come up with a clear strategy on how to do that. We use AWS services like Inspector, GuardDuty, Waffen Shield, CloudTrail, and VPC flow logs, amongst others, to help us shift left and let our application teams become active participants in security, all while maintaining the overall security guardrails that we need across that scale. Now let's take AWS Inspector as an example. Inspector gives us the control and flexibility that we need to quickly deploy vulnerability scanning into each of these 225 accounts without the friction that you oftentimes see with some of the more traditional security vulnerability management solutions. We chose to use Inspector because of its easier setup, along with the better control, distribution, and analytics that you get from its findings. It's yet another tool that helps us build and support the culture that we're striving for. Now, for those of you who have never worked with Inspector, um, it's not a centralized service. It requires you to set it up in each one of your accounts, and there is no CloudFormation support for it yet, although that might change, who knows. When you have over 225 accounts, that is a challenge. Setting up Inspector is just the beginning. Just because you set it up in your console doesn't mean you're up and running. You still have to get the agents installed on your machines. You still have to worry about what to do with those findings, uh, especially across 225 accounts. You still need to worry about doing analytics or ticketing for, for, for those findings so that the right vulnerabilities and, and the need to, to patch them goes to the right teams, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to build our own pipeline for our inspector findings. And today, we're pleased to share that work with you. We are making the source code available today on GitHub at the link you'll find there at the bottom of the screen. And what this code will do is a few things. It'll install a couple of Lambda functions within your account, one to set up Inspector if it's not already set up. During the setup time, when you run the CloudFormation template, it'll allow you to specify the key value uh, tag pairs that you want to match Inspector scans against. And then there's a second Lambda function that will take those findings, decorate what's in those findings to include the account ID and the account name so that you know where the findings are coming from, and then ship it all off to a centralized SNS topic of your choice. From there, I'll leave it up to you guys to do what you want with that data. As Steve mentioned, we've also been working with AWS during the beta period for guard duty, and we're very excited about what that will do to help us gain better insights into what's going on within each of these 225 plus accounts. And who knows, perhaps we'll have a very similar open source project as the one for Inspector, because at the end of the day, Inspector findings has findings, Guard Duty has findings, so there's a lot of similarities there. But it's an opportunity to really treat those two sources of data the same way. So hopefully we'll have something for you in the near future. I hope that that gives you a solid glimpse into how AWS Inspector and Guard Duty have helped us to simplify and secure our journey to the cloud. If you have any questions, please feel free to find me after this, and thank you. So you just heard Varum mention Inspector. Uh, some of the recent updates for Inspector, by the way, uh, Inspector assessments are now triggerable via CloudWatch events. Uh, we've added support for different versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, Amazon Linux, for example. The EC2 run command document to install the Inspector agent has been updated. Uh, different versions of CentOS, for example, have been supported. And we will add support for service-linked roles uh, to simplify the process to grant inspector permissions to run. Now, yes, Varum unfortunately had to, his uh, GitHub project that he just launched today, and literally we didn't know that we, each other was doing this. He launched that project. Uh, we just finished CloudFormation templates for inspector, and they'll be launched next week. <laughs> 
the funny thing, the reason here is this is, they've been a very, very vocal customer during the beta period, and they kept hitting us saying, guys, where's CloudFormation? Come on, you gotta do this. And if you've ever worked with Amazon on, on services before, uh, loud customers who have well-reasoned uh, choices for making certain things happen are their best way of driving new feature development in the organization. So yeah, we listened. Sorry, it was a little bit late. <laughs> so Amazon Cognito Security, let's shift gears a little bit here. Uh, yesterday, Cognito launched a beta of advanced security features for Cognito user pools. Uh, if you've used Cognito before, you're very familiar with how it helps you do authentication and authorization of mobile uh, or IoT. Uh, we've added adaptive authentication, which rates the risk of sign-in attempts and blocks or asks for a second factor based on characteristics such as a change in a device fingerprint. Additionally, users can now verify their identities using TOTP or time-based uh, one-time passcode generators like uh, Google Authenticator, for example. And when Cognito detects credentials that may have been compromised elsewhere, it enables you to warn users and prompt them or force them to change passwords. Some new Amazon S3 tooling. We believe that everybody should be encrypting everything at rest. It's just good sense. Uh, it makes it easier for us to do our job. It gives us less access to your information. It gives you better control. And in many cases, it's required by the regulations that you operate under. You can now make default encryption choices for S3 buckets. So without having to construct a bucket policy that rejects objects that aren't encrypted properly, you can simply force encryption to be on for everything that's put into a bucket. Important note. This is for new objects only. So if you have an existing bucket, you change this to say that you have to have, for example, um, SSE uh, for S3 encryption on. It will not go back and encrypt all of your old objects. You need to make that choice individually. There's also a detailed inventory report that's available that includes the encryption status of each object in an S3 bucket. And yes, the report itself can be encrypted. Permissions checks. We want to make it super obvious when your S3 bucket is open to the public. <laughs> so now when you go to the console, you will see a lovely little orange block that says public. Please make sure that the things that are marked as public, you intend to have them public. We talked about enforcing behavior through tooling. So this is a block diagram for an internal tool we have called Zelkova. Uh, it's a Lambda engine that does a bunch of automated reasoning on inputs. We do this intentionally because we want to prove the behavior or properties of systems rather than just hope we get the code right. This is an investment we've been making for about a year and a half here. And we use it in S3 and in Macy right now to help prove the properties of policies. It's driven by automated reasoning technology that looks at the semantic behaviors of various parts of the infrastructure and provides you security assurances about the behavior of that infrastructure. The real future of security, I think, is formally proving properties of security universally, making sure that we're doing what we actually think that we're doing. Can you imagine proactively going to an auditor saying, I have proven mathematically that this set of constraints is applied to all of my data? We're going to have to do a little training with most auditors to help them understand what that means, but it removes human judgment from that entirely. Here's what the Zelkova UI uh, looks like. You see that we're comparing two policies to determine which is more permissive. Has anyone ever implemented a more permissive policy in a data set that contains sensitive intellectual property or PII? Accidentally? Probably. So COVA gives you tools to help you el uh, eliminate that sort of source of error by proving which is actually more permissive than the other. The principal driver for formal proofs of services or software in AWS has been two groups. One is cryptographic. So when we launched S2N, signal to noise, which is our TLS replacement, 
we wanted to prove a bunch of things about the functionality of S2N, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. The other big driver has been financial services industries. They have wanted us to prove the behavior of our infrastructure, especially the controls that allow them to put their most important data up on AWS. Things like, prove to me that this machine cannot get to the internet ever. There is no path through all the other stuff that I have to get out there. Or prove that this box can only talk to this box. Zelkova helps them do that. Speaking of financial services, I'd like to welcome to the stage John Brady, who's VP of Cybersecurity and the CISO at FINRA. They've been a partner of ours for years. Thank you, Steve, and hello to everyone here. Um, that last slide I found kind of interesting because what NASDAQ does and what FINRA does was reversed. Kind of cool. Now I'm part of NASDAQ, apparently. Uh, but the funny thing there is actually FINRA started NASDAQ. So we're a stock market regulator. You wouldn't think of us as an innovator, but in 1971, we created NASDAQ and spun it off about 15 years ago uh, when it grew so large that it was really affecting our, our regulatory mission, which is the most important thing we do. So, as I said, FINRA is a regulator. We work together with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and our goal is to keep the stock markets fair, equitable, and transparent so that you as investors, you and me, we can trust those markets. Uh, obviously, a very important part as we save for retirement and other goals in our lives. To do everything we do as a regulator, we rely heavily on data. Um, we use data to find market manipulators, to find fraud in all its forms, whether it's in terms of the products and services being sold to investors, or um, manipulation of, uh, or insider trading, I think, is a, is a good example of that. And we also use it to track stockbroker dealers throughout their careers as they move from firm to firm they have a history that they've developed, and we don't want to lose that history. There's something we run called Broker Check. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but you can look up your stockbroker and see what their history is. Have they been a good person in terms of the services they provide to you, or have they maybe done some things some question, that are questionable at some point in their career? So in terms of big data, I thought before Steve's Steve threw out that number of 27 petabytes a day. I thought we had big data, but apparently we don't anymore. Um, but the markets themselves generate about 75 billion events on a typical, well, not a typical, that's a very busy trading day. Typical is in the 30 to 40 billion range. And an event can be a retail order that you place with your broker. It's also the routing of that order to a trading venue. It's modifications or cancellation of orders. And ultimately, it's the trades that, com that complete and come back to the brokerage. And then there are internal events about allocating those, those shares back to you and your account. So we, we keep seven years of this history. And unfortunately, it only adds up to 25 petabytes currently. So less than one day of what Steve does in his security services. Um, but for us, it's a big deal. And we use all this data to reconstruct what's going on in the stock markets at any moment in time. Um, and that is so that we can do a, f a few things, one of which is run automated surveillance patterns, so code that we've developed that just looks for known patterns of market fraud and misbehavior and generates alerts. Those alerts are then used by investigators, and the investigators may come back and ad hoc query this activity in the market so they can get a better understanding of it. So why did FINRA, which is a very conservative, risk-averse organization, move to the cloud? Good question, I think. Um, and it really, it boiled down to necessity more than anything else. So about four years ago, we, our legacy approach was primarily built on large data warehouse appliances, was becoming increasingly more difficult for us to live with. Data had to be moved from one place to another for processing. Um, volumes were increasing, so we'd run out of capacity. The capacity upgrades were extremely expensive and disruptive. To 
to bring in new capacity, you forklift in boxes, you migrate all your data while you're still trying to process in parallel, and then once you're over on the new box, you, you hope you have a few months at least before you have to do it all over again. Um, and on top of all that, the bad guys weren't sitting still. They were getting smarter and faster at what they do. Um, so we really needed nimbleness, we needed capacity in order to solve this problem. And as we first started looking at Hadoop, running Hadoop in our own data centers, and it was very promising, you know, scale, infinite scale out essentially until uh, you run out of space and power and cooling. Um, but it wasn't going to be much fun. It was, we were trading one set of problems for a new set of problems in order to, to maintain that platform over a large point of time. So we decided to look at a combination of open source big data platforms, which were fabulous, and the Amazon cloud. And the first thing it solved for us is near limitless capacity. When we need capacity, we just send a check. Um, probably the biggest enablement for us was the ability to decouple storage from processing. Because large portions of that seven year history of data just sits idle for, for a large portion of that seven years. Um, it gets used actively when it's fresh, and then it gets revisited at points and times during investigations. But most of the time, we don't need to query it. So if we don't need to query it, then it doesn't need to be in a, in a platform that supports querying. It can be offline. So that was huge. And then the ability to consume processing when we needed it. Um, market volumes vary from day to day and also within the day. And our processing is primarily focused in the morning hours of a business day because we receive yesterday's transaction information from all the market participants overnight and then we stitch it all together during the first two or three hours of the day, the work day, and then it's available to our staff to use for their work. And then we replaced what used to be a very manual pref method, uh, process to move data to where it needed to be with code. And this code, we call it HERD, H-E-R-D. It's available on GitHub. And what this does two things. One, it is a data management layer, and it also is a cluster orchestrator. So if a user has an investigation they need to do, they go to HERD, and through its UI, they make a request. HERD knows where the data is. They might be looking for a particular trading day, a particular stock symbol, and want to build an analytics platform with that data. And HERD will find the data, spin up a cluster forum, populate it with the data, and make it available to the user. So we're here to talk about security, and not all the rest of the stuff that I was just talking about. So in order to convince ourselves, our board of directors, our internal external auditors, and the SEC, who we answer to, since they are also our regulator, um, we had to kind of get over some hurdles. Understand that private data centers are not risk-free. A, a lot of people look at cloud and all they see is risk. And for me, security is about control and visibility. And when you look at cloud, you actually begin to realize that cloud actually gives you more control and more visibility as a security professional than you get in traditional private data centers. And we'll talk about why that is now. So Steve talked about most of the best practices in his talk. I want to really just focus on those two big themes, control and visibility. So if we look at just one thing, like minimizing the attack surface area, there are new things you can accomplish in the cloud that you can't do, I mean, at least not do easily or cheaply, in traditional data centers. Micro segmentation is a great example. With security groups and VPCs, you can create little, basically, bubbles around each of your servers so that they cannot be, uh, one compromise of one won't lead to compromise of all the rest. Entitlements are key. Encryption of everything, both at rest and in motion, is key. And then visibility. So with CloudTrail, the, the basic building blocks have been in Amazon for a long time. CloudTrail, um, CloudWatch, the 
you know, and, and then use of tools like inspector and config. But really, I'm getting excited about guard duty because at, having operated in Amazon for almost four years now, we have had to build a lot of our own security tooling before it was made available by AWS. So I've invested heavily in my own equivalent to guard duty, but it's missing one key ingredient that guard duty brings, and that is the machine learning and artificial intelligence that will do the, the automatic correlation of what's normal in my environment versus what is abnormal. So for me, I think of Amazon as a giant amplifier. I, I do my part, and they turn it up to 11. So thank you all for your time today. I hope. Thank you, John. Some interesting stats, because I think they're kind of fun to, to give you an idea about what scale really means to us. Uh, when you look at AWS, we have to secure both the physical and the virtual, since we have to secure the data setters themselves. Uh, if you've gone to these conferences before, you've heard me say some stuff about how, for example, we have rules that hard disks may never leave the red zone in our data centers, which is where customer data lives, intact. We destroy them on the way out because it's a simple control that's easily auditable. We do a lot of enforcement mechanisms there, and about one of the things that we watch for is the behavior of our employees. Are they doing things we expect them to do and not doing things that we don't want them to do? And part of that process is understanding video analytics. And you've heard probably in Andy's keynote a discussion about streaming video services from AWS. And that's an outgrowth of the desire to be able to map behavior of people or objects, et cetera, in near real time to actions and understand where they've gone and what they did. Uh, inputs are awesome for that. We run about 17,000 video cameras uh, in our data centers across the infrastructure. But in the logical world, we also watch what's going on, where we record the actual execution of processes on our machines that support your data everywhere. And that's about uh, 15 billion program executions are processed by our internal tooling in every day. That's understanding exactly what program executed what thing on what box at what time and where. Moving on to open source, we are a huge believer in getting good encryption in the hands of everyone everywhere. And whether that be the fact that we open sourced S2N or that we've added features to things like our VPC peering that allow you to do bulk encryption with anonymity. So if you ever focused on encryption before, uh, one of the, the problems with using simple TLS, for example, is I can do some analysis of traffic flows to understand uh, what is your peak and what is your valley and how much are you sending right now versus later on. I can't see into your data, but I can understand some of the behavior of your systems. With bulk encryption and an anonymity, we're adding padding to customers' data as it crows across pipes and aggregating it with other streams of customer data to make it more difficult for an adversary, whether it be a nation state or somebody else, to look at information about your use of our services globally. We formally verified random number generators that are in S2N, and the important part of the, the modifications to the random number generators in S2N is that we will add additional entropy to the process if we detect that the random number generator is not behaving as we expect. This is all available in open source, by the way. You can go inspect it yourself if you want to in the S2N tree. More fuzz tests. Fuzz tests are awesome ways to figure out, wow, I didn't expect that to break my stuff. Uh, we encourage people to do it, and it's something we focus a lot on. In the last 90 days, five new S3 encryption features. Uh, you can use ElastiCache for Redis with in-transit and at-risk encryption, for example. Uh, Cognito integrates with Pinpoint to add analytics. And Code Build now improves the ability to manage secrets in code. Please don't embed your passwords or keys in code, especially not when you go and post it on GitHub. Machine learning. John talked about use of machine learning to reduce the workload on his staff. Amazon Macy was our first step in that process. It does two things. Number one, it helps you understand your data. It has a classifier that goes through your information and picks out things that are interesting using natural language processing. It then says, OK, you've got humans who are accessing that data. What are they doing? And is that consistent with the access patterns that you expect? 
Examples of the types of data that are visible in Amazon S3, which is the first place that we've implemented in Amazon Macy, whether it's PII or personal health information, uh, static website content, for example, or source code, SSL certificates and private keys, the number of customers in the Macy beta who ran on their own infrastructure, their own stuff sitting in S3 and found SSL certs in places they didn't expect was high. Why does that matter? Well, because the private key is in there often. You need to protect that. Uh, iOS and Android app signing keys. Well, why is that important? Well, what if somebody else gets a hold of your signing keys, writes a new app, calls it your app's name, and then signs it? So it looks like it's from you. Your customers might not appreciate that. Database backups often contain treasure troves of data, and Macy will help you identify those as well. Macy is currently processing about 10 billion activity records per day and has analyzed petabytes of data since its launch. Uh, of the tens of thousands of S3 buckets that Macy's analyzed, customers report 14% of their buckets and objects had configurations that enabled access outside of the intended group of people. Macy helped them close that gap. Macy is now approved for use with HIPAA workloads. What does that mean for healthcare customers? That you can be proactive with your security and compliance requirements and execute the preventative security that's necessary under the law and regulation. It also classifies critical information, helping you identify business critical data and analyze the access patterns that your people have to that data. I wanna focus your most valuable resource, your security engineers, on those things that none of our stuff can do. Our job is to reduce the amount of noise that your security engineering staff have to pay attention to. Collecting all the logs and throwing them in one place is an awesome first start, but there's so much there. They need help in winnowing that down. Other security sessions that you should take a look at if you have the time, uh, there's an Amazon guard duty session, of course. That's the next session up in this room right here. Um, I am Policy Ninja. This, by the way, was one of the highest rated uh, sessions that we've had uh, across the security track, so it's really quite cool. Uh, encryption uh, strategies. If you're interested in implementing encryption properly, SSID or SID uh, 330 is excellent. Uh, all of the sessions, by the way, have a reserved component and a walk-up component. There's 25% of the seats that are reserved uh, for people who, well, they are 25% set aside for people who don't have a reservation. On Thursday, the philosophy of Amazon security. This is a fun one. It's about how we think about security and how we think about people and security. Uh, and it's got a very interesting sort of introspection into the way that we make decisions as an organization and the behaviors that we try and inculcate with our teams. Security automation improvements with CloudWatch and Config, excellent starting point for folks who are looking to automate their security operations. I also want to mention an event that we're sponsoring tonight to highlight our efforts in inclusion. Tonight at the Encore, we'll be hosting a reception called We Are Giants, Diversity and Inclusion in Tech. Uh, there's going to be food, uh, beverages, uh, and of course, some swag. We hope to see you there. Thank you.